Uh, good morning. I'm going to try to be brief. I know everyone's um, anxious to get their coffee break, and I'm going to try to um, build on what Catherine and Victor just said. Uh, I'm going to try to leave us with a little bit about what can we do, what is happening uh, to promote health equity in cities, uh, both in the global north and south. And I want to give some examples from work that uh, we're doing collaboratively at Berkeley, uh, University of California, Berkeley, with NGO and local government partners. Um, and basically make the case, much of which you've heard already, and I'll go through this very quickly, that place really matters, that uh, intra-city comparisons are in fact more important in my view than comparing across cities, that institutions matter, and I'll say more about that, and particularly urban planning, uh, and the practice of health impact assessment is one uh, particular institution that uh, uh, I think holds some promise, and that new science really matters, that in fact we can't continue the same kind of epidemiology, the same kind of urban analyses that we are doing to get at the health equity problems we're, we're hearing all about. And I'll give some quick examples from San Francisco. This is much of a review of what you've already heard this morning, um, that urban living can be beneficial to health, but it depends on where you live and how that city is governed. Um, and that when we talk about health in cities, that that's not about healthy cities, I would argue. Health in cities really is a discourse and a practice of continuing to address health care and specific diseases, not focused on both assets and solutions, um, and really continues to focus uh, in a very traditional public health way uh, on one disease, one exposure, and changing one behavior, but not the cumulative burdens and vulnerabilities that many of the communities you've heard about already today face, uh, and we can't continue to treat people and send them back into the living and working conditions that made them sick in the first place. I just want to quickly give you a definition of what I mean by health equity. Uh, public health has done a great job. Ricky talked earlier, 150, 200 years of documenting health inequities, problems. Uh, and we hear more and more about that. Uh, and that keeps epidemiologists employed. But health equity, what do we really mean by that? Is a much more difficult concept culturally, politically, uh, it needs to be culturally and politically uh, contextualized, but really focused on broad societal efforts uh, to, avoid, to address avoidable inequalities um, and focusing on equaling the conditions to promote health, particularly for groups that are currently uh, disadvantaged. Uh, and I'm going to argue that we, uh, we need to rethink uh, urban governance uh, around health equity. And borrowing from the World Health Organization definition of governance, of course, is not just government, but the norms routines, institutions, and evidence base, back to science, of collective action, and includes at least, I would argue, these seven things, identifying and framing new policy issues, generating new standards of evidence, constituting some social actors as experts and others as not part of that discourse, uh, dealing with the chronic, really, uncertainty that we face in very dynamic cities, um, issues of public accountability and transparency, implementation, uh, and learning key pieces in a very dynamic urban uh, environment. How do we learn and adjust uh, as new information and new actors emerge? A um, couple of examples, one from our, our work here in the San Francisco Bay Area. This is around 9 million people focused on uh, intra-urban uh, health inequities in uh, the cities of San Francisco, Richmond, and Oakland, California. Um, fairly, obviously, wealthy by global standards, but a lot of uh, urban divestment and health inequities. Um, just to review some of the, these data, let's see, how, this pointer, I'm not sure how this works, but basically what we're seeing here is neighborhood poverty uh, and uh, infant mortality. So the uh, higher the neighborhood poverty group, basically in places, the higher their mortality, and this is disaggregated by ethnicity with African Americans facing the greatest burden. Uh, we have a 15-year difference in life expectancy in neighborhoods just a few kilometers apart, uh, even in the wealthy San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, this is the longitudinal data of health inequities by race and ethnicity in the same region, uh, and we can see things are getting worse, not better, in terms of the growing inequalities and gap. This is um, life expectancy between whites and African Americans between 1960 and 2005, and the gap is increasing. And again, we see this trend in cities around the world, and if we look across different scales. People say, well, if you just look at neighborhood, just look at city, just look at nation, we see the same trend no matter the scale. Um, the higher the poverty rate in, in a place, um, the higher the mortality. Um, so what 
is a hypothesis that we might think about uh, instead of focusing on one disease, focus on cumulative disadvantage. Uh, and one is the stress sort of cumulative weathering hypothesis that multiple burdens on populations are driving these inequities. So to focus just on one disease really won't get us there. And the idea goes like this, that under normal circumstances, uh, in a stressful situation, you have a, a hormonal uh, response, cortisol and adrenaline, um, and that hormonal release kind of shuts off the stress and you uh, recover. But under conditions of chronic and constant stress in many uh, impoverished neighborhoods around the world, that hormonal release doesn't shut off and continues. Um, and then we see, particularly in the uh, non-infectious disease, the impacts of this kind of constant weathering on the body uh, and its likely impact on uh, many of the epidemic and chronic diseases. So what are we doing? Um, we've been, the work in, in the Bay Area has really been driven by community-based organizations in partnership and pressuring local government uh, and universities to get involved. Um, land use issues, uh, but also non-health policies, policies around living wages, policies around climate uh, planning, uh, have led us to uh, engage in a practice of health impact assessment, which is really an analytic tool and a process of looking at the positive and negative impacts of non-health, meaning non-health service policies. Um, we've documented in uh, different uh, development projects the role of stress and disruption to people's uh, families, disruption of social networks, noise, uh, environmental uh, impacts, and particularly important is racial residential segregation uh, and the perpetuation of that in this region. Uh, some of the impacts have been redesigning land use projects, new policies around uh, inclusionary housing, affordable housing, uh, development fees, impact fees, uh, to in ensure that uh, health beneficial infrastructure is built and maintained, um, and uh, new mitigation for uh, for air quality uh, issues in, uh, near uh, roadways. Uh, one of the most important things we've done is to uh, develop indicators to track over time. This is one example that's available on the web, a healthy development measurement tool that's being widely used, uh, which we've done uh, you know, mapping of, of inequalities and then overlaying these to cumulative disadvantage, which is the map you see here on the right. Uh, just quickly, the work that we're doing in, in Nairobi, I think, complements the idea of the importance of governance. And this is in the Mathare uh, informal settlement, not too far from where Catherine um, and, and her work uh, is happening. And this work, again, is really driven by community-based organizations who uh, do uh, micro savings that organize residents, they do household surveys and mapping to see what are the living conditions under which people uh, are faced and how do we then prioritize uh, planning and decision making in a collaborative way. Just two quick examples, this is some of our mapping from this Mathari informal settlement of the people per functioning water uh, point. Um, and you can see the great inequalities here. 250 would be the maximum sphere standards, uh, and we have up to 2,000 in some of the villages uh, of this informal settlement, which is a, a approximately 150,000 people. Uh, what we've done is to try to address that issue, uh, but at the same time develop a long-term planning process, uh, and this is um, uh, one of our successful interventions um, of household-level water connections in one of these settlements uh, which we think is one of the first in Nairobi to have a uh, household level water connection. Uh, toilets are also obviously a big issue. This is a same mapping of public toilets uh, and the vast inequalities here of uh, the sphere standards and the uh, uh, inequalities that people face. And of course, uh, unsafe uh, toilets, and we're, this is a big issue for us because we're in a fight with the World Bank that wants to continue to fund communal level toilets. Uh, Amnesty International, many of you have probably saw this report that came out about inequalities in uh, health and violence and rape linked to community uh, facilities that are not well lit, that are unsafe for women, particularly at night, uh, perpetuating sexual violence. Uh, uh, and, and, and other ine health inequalities. We really want to look relationally at our work um, and not just at one disease uh, or at one um, risk factor at a time. So really to conclude, policy really matters. We need to think about policy and cumulative dis disadvantage. We need to rethink institutions um, uh, to create change. That p urban planning matters, but it doesn't have actually a very good history of promoting health equity. Uh, and we need to rethink the science of how we co-produce uh, uh, evidence and monitor and evaluate as we go. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat>